go over and define what is an object, specifically as it falls under object-oriented programming. At least we're going to try, because this is a very complicated sort of topic. And it's very difficult to kind of encapsulate and cover in like an hour. We'll probably go just a hair over that. Um, something about like sending messages, what does that even mean? And then ultimately uh, making our own objects. We're gonna talk about something called self. So feel free to kind of ask a million questions because it's very thought provoking and philosophical in a lot of ways. And then we're gonna see our first sort of dive into what is known as syntactical sugar. And that is gonna be, I can write out all of this code or I can use a shortcut that's gonna build a lot of these things for me. That's sort of a little bit sexier, a little sleeker, and it just takes up uh, less lines of code, but it's still just as readable. What I don't want you to do is measure the quality of your code against the number of lines. So just because what I've heard yesterday in the Hashcabal review was like, oh wow, I have so many more lines of code. Um, that is not a good unit of measure, right? Uh, the idea is that you can have a bunch of comments, you can make very clear, explicit named variables that will just take more lines, but it doesn't mean that your code is any worse or any better, it just means that it takes more lines. So try not to measure yourself against how few lines you've used. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So the first thing I wanna talk about is I'm going to jump into what is known as the IRB. Have you seen this? Cool, what is the IRB? Oh, it's tricky, right? Yeah, yeah. Imagined? Maybe your imagination now. Um, yeah, it's very, very super ultra mega close. I stands for, yeah. So it's like an interactive Ruby. And the thing is, this is just running Ruby code. So if I do one plus one, it's two, All right? Um, is it, what is it? I think it's interactive Ruby. Yeah. yeah. And all it really is, is it's known as a REPL, so you've probably seen this, this website. Um, it's like, it, it can read Ruby, it can evaluate Ruby, so if I'm writing methods, it'll definitely uh, understand what it is. It can print to the screen, and then it'll finally do something known as a looping. So if I do like a for loop, or I do a dot each, I do some of those iterators, it will in fact run and execute that code. And so here inside the REPL, uh, what I'm gonna do is kind of just go over the basics, right, and then kind of build on that. So the first thing I wanna talk about is what is this with these square hard brackets? What is that? Right, I've made, sorry, this is ice. Yeah. I made a brand new array, right? And if I enter, I can just create what is known as a array literal. Because I'm making literally a brand new array. What that actually is translated from is how you can create an array from scratch as opposed to just putting the square brackets and then everyone assuming that that's an array. So if I do something like array.new, that would also give me an array. That is sort of the correct, proper computer programming way to sort of do it. But the idea is, is this is just so readable. If I just put these square brackets, everyone in here already knew, oh, that's an array. So I'm going to literally make a brand new array from scratch without using that new syntax on array.new. So far, so good? So um, what do we know about arrays in terms of the methods that are already magically sort of available to them? Can anyone name any sort of array method? Right, dot each, right? So in theory, right, I can do an array, and I can do dot each. Notice that this dot operator is what is calling on the array object, I'm calling a method called dot each on it. And so I can take a look at all of their methods by simply doing the array class, and I can check all their methods. Wow, so many methods. So we're not gonna get into it today, but there is this idea um, behind where all of these come from. We'll take a deeper dive into that on Friday, but if we do array, right, dot ancestors, we could see that array actually pulls from the innumerable class, the object class, the kernel class, and then finally the basic object class. So any of the methods that are built on the basic object, on the kernel, on the object, on the innumerable will also be available on the array. And so that's where all of these methods are basically kind of coming from. And so 
what the nice thing is, we know some of the array methods, right? We call them enumerables, but that's where they're coming from. That's why we call them that. What about a string, right? What are the methods for a string? What are some methods that you know? Yeah, right? And I'm sure it's somewhere in here. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Uh, I just find it. Okay. It's weird. You guys see it? I'm so difficult to find. What are you looking for? Down case? I know it's on here. That's weird. Hmm. Down. Yeah, that's weird. It should be on there. Oh, maybe I'm an idiot. Yeah, they're yeah, they're probably like they're past this because like my screen I sort of cut it off. Sorry about that. So that's where all these methods are kind of coming from, right? They're inheriting them from like these parent classes. Um, and I'm using this word class a lot. Does anyone want to take a stab at what a class is? What does that really mean? An object, okay. That's pretty close, right? Classes are very much related to objects. It's a set of blueprints. Yeah, I would definitely describe it in that way. Right? It's a set of blueprints for creating objects. So what that means is uh, anytime I make a brand new string, it's pulling from the string class. So any methods inside the string, anytime I make a brand new string, it's going to have access to all of the string properties and methods. So uh, what I kind of want to do is let's just try making like a bunch of dogs with a bunch of key value pairs. So I can have like dog one and I can simply do this like hash like syntax and I can have a name and that name can point to, you guys like this hash syntax or like the symbol? We'll do this. All right. And what is this dog's name? Spot Fido classic. All right. And then we can have dog two be Fido. Any other dog names? What? Scruffy? Okay. You guys remember Scruff McGruff the crime dog from Chicago? No? Do you guys remember this one? It's a classic. All right? It's supposed to be big and red. All right, so Ruby is what is known as like a dynamically typed programming language versus a strongly typed or statically typed programming language. Does anyone have an idea of what that means? I'm asking you a lot of questions. I'm just trying to like gauge where everyone is. Sometimes I get a class where like half of them are computer science people, and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm, I know where to kind of have a baseline. Yeah, don't, don't, don't be scared. You know, it's cool. I think it's right. So a strong. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're not going to dive into that. But a strongly typed language, meaning you have to, if I make a brand new variable like dog4, right, I have to specify what this is. I have to say dog4 is going to be a hash, and it will have three key values. And then I hit enter, and then I have to manual assign each one of the three key values. Versus Ruby, where I can have dog4, and this can be a dog, and can have a name, and it can be uh, princess acorn, right? classic dog name. And then if I wanted to, I can go, just kidding, dog4 is now an array of one and two. I can just change the data type on the fly. I can even do dog4, just kidding, is now a string that says, I'm so fluffy. Oop. My face. Right. So sort of like this type, this data type, can be changed on the fly in this like dynamically typed programming language. And based on the type of data that we have, right, we have certain methods on it. So now dog4 is what data type? A string, right? So can I call any of the hash methods on dog4 now? No, right? I can only call string methods on it. And so what I want to do is kind of show you the fact that if I'm making all these dogs, it can be a little bit repetitive and it's a little bit difficult to sort of like run into. What we can do is we can make a brand new file and we can create our own classes. And so let's take a look. If I'm in this like folder, I can make a dog.rb. 
And all I'm going to do is I'm going to create a brand new dog class. Some of you have gotten to this already. So how would I sort of start this? All right, with this class syntax, just class. And then I want to make a dog class. So what do I need to write here? Dog with a capital D-O-G, right? Like Snoop. Um, but what if I wanted to make a class like a good dog? How would I do that? Should it just be like this? Good dog? Now what about, oh, you're right, capital, is that okay? Right, it's what is known as camel casing. And that is like the capital letters sort of indicate whether or not something has multiple words in it. But the way the class syntax is read and the way that the Ruby interpreter is working is it doesn't like sort of these spaces. You'll start to see the highlighting kind of bug out once I put all these spaces in. So I want to make a class dog. And whenever I open something, I make sure I end. I even put these little like comments in here. I put end dog class. And this is going to be very helpful later on. As I start to write a ton of code, I don't want to get lost as to like where my ends are. Have you done any of the pre-work? You had a bunch of if statements, like if and if and you're like, oh man, where's that one end? And you're like, oh, this is a little dicey. So if you make little comments for yourself, that's really going to kind of help you sort of identify where things open and close. So in this dog class, how can I sort of create a brand new one? What is like the special keyword that's in here? Dot new. Dot new is how I can make a new one, correct? But I heard it. Yeah, it's this initialize method. So the initialize, right? Def initial. I haven't spelled it in so long. That doesn't seem right. It doesn't. I feel like initialize. It's like Italian. All right, this is what I normally do. I use DFI and I press tab. That's why I've never spelled it. All right, there's, just, there's a bunch of shorthands that you'll learn about. So that was uh, very embarrassing. Thank you for uh, some of you who laughed at me. That made me feel a lot better. And what is this define initialize? What is this doing? Basically, it's giving the class blueprint for when the object is created to actually. Right, so when this. Yeah, yeah. So, like. Basically, we talked about this class syntax being a blueprint, right? If I want any attributes for this dog, I have to put them when I first make it. So I do dog.new, and then I can put in like a name or something. That way, this dog that I just made has a name. So in this initialize method, um, if you want to know these shortcuts, I can click one. My text editor will highlight the other ones. But if I actually want to select them, I hold command and I press D. Boop. I press D again, and now I've highlighted all of them. So whatever it is that I'm typing will technically be in all three of those places. So I can put this, boom. Wow. That's how you type with the maximum speed, right? So now I have, hmm? It's the best thing ever. Oh, well, you're welcome. You're welcome. Have you had pizza? Um, <laughs> so I'm initializing this brand new dog, right? And as you pointed out, if I wanted to create one, I'll make a brand new one. What I can do is I can do dog dot new, right? And now I need to pass in arguments. But where are those arguments sort of coming from? It's going to be this initialize method. So I can do dog dot new, and I can pass it. Anyone have another dog name? This is my dog name. Lyra. Lyra. L y r a. Okay, that's almost like the fabric. Very stretchy. Wow. <laughs> Wow, cool. I will also name a dog JavaScript. Those are just classic, <laughs> classic dog names, right? And so now essentially what I'm doing is making these like four new dogs. If uh, I'm doing that, I'm just going to require my good friend because I like to make, and you've seen it already several times, a lot of what we technically describe in industry as boo-boos. Right? Not really, I just made that up. So if I want to actually pause the code, I'm going to put it at the end and not in the beginning here. Why would I want to take a look at these dogs and put the binding pry on 17 versus 11? You said, yeah, I didn't want to attribute your correct answer to anyone else. Yes, exactly. Like if I put the binding here, boop, 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 right? It's actually going to pause it on 17 so that I now actually can see all these dogs. The problem is when I make this new dog, right, in the same way that if I was in the IRB, and I made this array and I had all these great things in it, blah, 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 blah. That was really aggressive. 
accidentally turn on caps lock. If I hit enter, um, one, it'll error out because none of those are real variables, but I'll lose a reference to it. So for example, how can I reference that array now? How can I call that array? I kind of can't. I should set it to a variable so I have access to it later. So I can do array equals to a one, two, three. That way, once I've hit enter, I can do array and sort of call it back. All right? So in that same way, I probably need a reference to this, right? I'm super lazy. I should probably call this like dog one, but I'm gonna just do this because I'm a, I'm a dirtbag. So what do you think I'm gonna name this? Powerful, all right? But if you wanna know more, doo -doo -doo -doo, if you click this, there's so much you can do in terms of your editor that really powers you up, right? So besides that command D, which I thought was a wild, awesome response, if you hit option, and you scroll, you can make more dogs, right? We don't want to do that. We just want D uh, and then equal. Unfortunately, you can't really do like like the spreadsheet stuff where you like drag it and it like counts up. That's too powerful. If you know how to do that, let me know. I would love to learn. Uh, and I'm sure it's possible, but that didn't really take me too much time. So also, we don't need like three JavaScript dogs. I just wanted to show you that there's so much you can do with your text editor which is why coding is done in like a text editor, IDE. So you have like Atom, there's Visual Code, I'm using Atom, right? There's some that you can pay for that have a lot of built-in features like RubyMine, WebStorm. But the reason why you do this is because of these shortcuts that allow you to code much faster where you basically aren't worried about little things like did I spell initialize correct? Or I want to make a bunch of them, right? If I want to copy this, Command-Shift-D just basically gives me a new copy. In theory, if you wanted to, there's nothing stopping you from opening WordPad and writing a bunch of code, but the highlighting won't be there. You won't have any of the, the sexy shortcuts. And so that's just the idea as to like what we use a text editor for. And that is to help us write better, cleaner, faster code. Cool? In case anyone kind of like asks you that. No one has ever asked me that, but just so you know. Oh, for the packages, I'm so sorry. Uh, you'll start to learn a lot of these shortcuts, but if you hold command comma, this is typically a very common shortcut for just opening options. So if you don't remember that really, you can always go here and you can go to preferences. So that's like the, uh, not command, sorry, it's the, yeah, it's command, that little like custom made Apple symbol, like that's not real. Um, yes, uh, let me pause the recording while I answer that question. And if it's free, it's for me. So back to this dog, right? I'm making these dogs, I set the variables so that I have a reference to them, and I'm just gonna leave this binding so I can actually test them. So boop, don't forget to see. Yes, I, I, I started the recording, but thank you. You'll see that there's, oh, just kidding, that this is, uh, it's on record mode. So if it's not, you'll see this, it's supposed to change to like a plus sign when I pause it. But either way, um, great. I'm going to run this code now, right? How do I actually run this file? This is very useful for when you're on your own labs, but you don't necessarily understand what our spec is or like learn and all the magic that it's doing under the hood. How can I test individual files? How can I run this code? Right. So I can go into my command line and I can simply type in Ruby, which is a command. I can tell what file to open. So here, if I do ls, like list all the files, you'll see that I have a readme, this bank account file, which we'll get into, this dog file, and this powerful money file. Warning, no money. So ruby dog.rb, and essentially what it'll do is it'll run the code, and then it'll pause and hit the binding on line 19. It's just gonna read through and try to execute, and now I'm at the binding. What do I have access to now that I'm here? Right, like D1 through 4, right? So what is D, okay, that doesn't exist. What is D4, right? I have this brand new dog object that has an attribute of JavaScript, right? Common dog name. If I want to take a look at this dog name, how can I do that? D4 dot? Name. Right, so D4 dot name, right? What is that dot 
name sort of indicate to you? In the same way that in the array, we talked about the dot each method. What is the dog dot name? How would you describe that? Is that a variable? Is that a data type? Or is that a... It is an attribute, but more specifically, the dot name, the dot operator is calling a, you guys could just shout it out. A right, a method, right? Sorry about that. Yeah, just please shout it out. I'm a extrovert, I don't know if you could tell, and I will feed off of your energy. And so that's great, um, like a vampire. So if I do d4.name, I'm expecting to see JavaScript, except I get this undefined method name for this dog object. And that makes sense because I'm trying to call a method dot name on the dog object. So I can solve that. Gotta get out of that pry. And I can easily just go, oh my god, I need a method name. Boop, boop, boop. I can make a new method called name. And what do I want this to return? I want this to return whatever instance, right, the instance variable, this at sign, is for this particular dog. So if I just put at name. Now I've created what is known as this reader method. This reader method is simply just going to return what the attribute at name is. So if I try running it again, bloop, I'm simply going to get d4.name. And now I've built that name method. And now JavaScript comes back. And so what if I wanted to overwrite? And I wanted to be like, you know what? Somebody told me JavaScript's not a popular dog name, and for whatever reason, she never comes, she never responds. So I'm going to change her name. So how can I do that? What would make sense for you? I can probably do something like, you want to say? Uh, create a new method. Name is a variable. Yeah, I, I can definitely make a brand new method that resets the name, right? What would that look like, though? Yes, exactly. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get there. So let me like walk through like what kind of that answer is. The idea is that simply, remember when I did like earlier, I had like array equals to a ray equals to an array. And then I wanted to change it and be like, yo, psych, just kidding. Let's make that a string of array. So really what this is, is I'm just using this like equal like operator this assignment operator to kind of reassign it. And so if I'm trying to reassign the name, what I'm really looking to do is something along the lines of d4.name, which is comes out as JavaScript. What I want to do is make it so that it's something like this. This name equals, and then like a new name, like powerful. Only it says something like undefined method name equals, and that's kind of like what you're alluding to, right? What I'm doing is really just trying to reassign it. And the problem is people don't really realize that this name equal is exactly like this name equal, only there's a space there. And so this syntactical sugar is so powerful. Def name equal is sort of the method. Really, it's doing this, but I have to build this method, the one that you're talking about. And the problem is I actually need to know at name is going to be equal to, I'm going to reassign it to what? Well, if we look, d4.name is powerful. What I'm really sending it is an argument. And that argument is going to be this powerful string. So if I rewrite this, it could look like this, d4.name equal, and then an argument of this is the new name. This is what it basically boils down to and what it will look like. So what are these parentheses sort of indicating right here after this equal sign? Right, the new name, like what the arguments are for this method. So this is going to be the new name, right? And then naturally, at name should be what? The new name. All right, so if I do that, boop, I'm going to get right back into the pride. All right, d4.name, 
equals to, does anyone have another cool doggo name? Neo. Neo? Neo. Oh, Neon. Huh. That's cool. And so, it's your dog name? Nice. All right. So now we have this name sort of like be able to be reassigned. Cool. I think that a lot of you probably like got through labs. Does that sort of make sense? The idea is that lectures should be covering sort of like how everything's working. At least visualize it so you're like it's exactly what I thought it was. Because it can be hard absorbing a lot of the learnings just from the reading. So if this is making sense, it should be good. If it's completely off base from what you think it is or what you're learning is, this is a really good time to ask those questions. Um, but I can tell that like this class wants to move a little bit forward, so I'm gonna like move faster. So when I talked about that syntactical sugar, what I mean is this is what is known as like the reader. I'm simply gonna read an attribute and this is going to reassign. This is gonna write to one of the attributes. What you can do is you can do adder reader. So attribute reader, and you can pass in the attribute, which is the name. This is character for character, exactly the same as this. So I don't actually even need this. So this right here is the first time you're seeing syntactical sugar. If I write just this code, it's actually going to build this method for me under the hood. Yeah? In the same way that I can have an adder writer, also for name. And that's going to build this. So I don't need either of these if I have the adder, and reader, and writer. I think that you've gotten to the point in the lab, what is this combo of both? All right. So you have the, I think it's like, dang I know W's tab builds the writer, and then R tab builds the reader. Do you know what builds the accessor? No, that's the AC. Ugh. Ugh. See what happens? You try to get too fancy. All right, cool. So you have adder. Oop. RW. Oh, bless up. Read and write. Wow. Powerful. So you have name here. That'll build you the, the getter and the setter, which is the reader and the writer. Cool? All right, so no questions on this dog. Now let's actually put this into, yeah. Oh, okay. Right, very good. Um, the question is, is this now a symbol? Uh, no, not really. Uh, for adder accessor, it takes in as arguments a list of attributes. So if I had also like uh, breed or something as an attribute, then it will take arguments as symbols. And it will just map them to this. Pass in a hash to where? Oh, no, no, no. What it's saying is you have an attribute of name, and you also now have an attribute of breed. So I'm going to do this. Boop. Boop. I'm going to highlight this. Command D that bad Johnson. And then super fast. All right. So now I have two attributes, right? I'm going to get to you in a second. What's up? You said you're going to get Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh. I have two attributes now. So it's taking arguments, the name of the attribute, but it wants it as a symbol. That's how this is working. It doesn't actually convert it. It's saying, um, this right here would theoretically be looking for a variable name, which doesn't exist, so it takes it as a symbol, as opposed to accepting an argument as a string. It doesn't transform the data, it's just looking for a symbol that matches um, the name of the attributes. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. What's up? Um, so what if you don't um, pass in Okay, so the question is, if I basically put dog.new and I don't put in an attribute, well, let's take a look. I put in breed, I snuck it in there, but I only put in one argument here. I still have the binding, so let's actually run it. What? Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> It'll break on you, right? It, uh, I forgot that. I should have moved the binding up. Surprise ruined. Uh, it's saying that you must initialize this with two arguments. So the fact that I pass this one, it breaks. It's like, hey, I need, I need two. But do you 
Default arguments. So like now if I run it, let's take a look, and I see dog one, dog two, dog three, dog four. Especially number one. It's my dog. You're right, you're right. Everyone except th four. All right, so yeah, that's basically setting a default argument. All right, let's like put this into like a practical example, right? The reason we write code is because we want to model like the real world and we want to build something that is uh, based in code that can be useful in the real world. So the first thing that I like to think of that I like to do is I like to build like this bank account class. I think it's uh, extremely practical. The first thing I'm gonna do is require pry because obviously I'm a terrible developer. So I wanna make sure I can debug that bad Johnson. And I have this bank account. So bank account. Cool, I was hoping someone would just be like, no boo, you suck. But you know, you guys are very polite and that's nice. So what was that popular shortcut that I talked about? For the initialize, DFI, all right? Look at that. You can put DEFI, but no one wants to do that. Oh, just kidding. Great. So we're going to create this like bank account class because it models after something in the real world. Um, what this is basically going to do is we can create brand new accounts within this bank, and each one of these accounts are going to have different attributes, specifically different values for different attributes. So in this bank account class, what are the attributes of a bank account? If you were to go to uh, Chase, all right, the First World Bank of Evans Wang or HSBC, and you're like, I want to open up a brand new account. What are some of the attributes of this bank account? <laughs> That's the first one? OK, sure. So we have a number. Cool. Anything else? All right, it's probably the amount, like how much is in this account. That makes a lot of sense, right? Anything else? Owner. Owner, okay. Um, we could do owner. Interesting. Mm -hmm. boop, boop. All right, and so three is good for right now because uh, honestly, the deeper we go, the more complicated it becomes. And I just want to like kind of hit like the basic points. So the first thing we realize, right, is we need to be able to access some of these attributes. So do I put add or accessor for everything? No, right? That would be crazy. So why would I not want to put an add or accessor for your account number? Yeah, because you can't change the account number, right? Nobody really could kind of change your account number. If you need a new account, well, it sounds like exactly the English. You need a new account. You can't change that number. So for the reader, R, I'm going to use like the account number. All right, but what about the amount? Does the amount ever change in your bank account? I would hope so. You know, Unfortunately, don't worry. After these 15 weeks, take care. All right, so should this be the reader, the writer, or the accessor? Learning what I just learned, RW. All right, and the idea is that the amount can go up and it can go down, right? And then naturally, what about the owner? Can the owner change on the account? But then you'd be making a new account. You could do that. You could do that. Um, so, oh, you're right. You could change your name. Something I've obviously done based on my reaction. Um, okay. Right. So for the accessor, do I need another accessor for owner? No, I could just tell that this accessor has two uh, attributes that can be both read and written. So, cool. Let's uh, let's start thinking about some real world scenarios, right? The first thing is, uh, let's open a brand new bank account, right? Who wants to own this? Steven Duran. Well, what's the well, we get to set it, you know? 
And that's the fun thing about development. You can do anything you want, right? Um, like, for example, like, for whatever reason, when I was teaching this last time, I was talking about trees, and somebody was like, oh my god, let's make an orange tree. And I'm like, can we make more? I'm like, yeah. And I just did orange tree dot new a million times. And they're like, oh my god, there's so many orange trees. So it's like, the possibilities are endless. So bank account dot new. And we have those three attributes. Does the order matter? Should I put the owner first? Like if I were to put Steven here, right? Would that automatically somehow map to the owner? No, it's gonna go in the correct order. So the first order of business is going to be the account number. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it as a string because I'm a dirtbag and your lucky account number one. Ooh, yes. spicy, all right? And what about the amount? What is the deposit that you put in here? That's right, very good. So um, the idea is that you are starting with Monopoly money, which is, I don't know, you've just passed go and you've collected $200. Sorry, these jokes are for me. Um, <laughs> all right, let's take a look. We've written a lot of code, but the right thing to do is definitely to test. We should be testing incrementally, but I don't want to bore you, but I want to make sure that we definitely say that explicitly, that every time we write something, we want to test it. When I built the reader, I want them to test it. When I built the accessor, I want them to test it. Um, but here, I've kind of built out the class. I've built out a reader, two accessors, I've even instantiated a new bank account. Let's test this code. So I'm going to do Ruby, and I'm going to use the file name. Boop, boop. I think this works. You can like, uh, boop, 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 boop. Let me take this. Oh. oh, no, that didn't work. In Visual Studio Code, you could do that. You could drag your files onto the terminal, and it'll just put the path there. It's very powerful. Uh, Adam, done goofed. All right, great. So we have a bank account, right? And I use that tab to finish. I just put BA. And because nothing else has like BA in here, it just autofill for me. So once I run that code, I now have the bank account class. And then I created a brand new bank account. So if I take a look at Steven, I see that Steven is in fact a bank account object, which is an interesting sentence to say, but totally makes sense in like a development world. Uh, what should I be able to do? Right, I should definitely be like, yo, listen, Steven is a developer and he makes buku bucks. So Steven should be able to change the amount of money he makes, all right? Instead of 200, I can simply hard code and assign that now he has two, $2,000, right? Um, but that's not like a good user experience, right? Is that what you normally do? You go to the bank, you're like, look, there's like 80 bucks in here but now there's gonna be 100, you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't do that, you just go, hey, here's a 20, now I should have $100, because I had 80 in there. So really, it's sort of like this Steven dot amount, and have you seen this yet? I don't wanna to go too far, right? This plus equals? Yeah. So basically, I'm like adding on top of, right? So the idea is that I wanna be able to be like add another $1,000, we're just making it rain over here, and that's what should be happening. So what would you describe that in English? A transaction but specifically a deposit so does it make sense to always do like this Steven dot amount plus equals we want to write something so it looks like Steven dot deposit and then put in a value and then have that value increase right so something along the lines of Steven dot deposit and then some money money in here right we could do that because that looks just like a method so boop, boop, boop def deposit and this takes in some money or right like dollar dollar value all right that's not gonna work Ooh. dollar value right like whatever like you name the variables that make sense to you i'm gonna leave dollar value because one i'm a thug and two i'm not a thug uh i think it's funny but the idea is like naming stuff is very hard the better you name it, the easier and better your code becomes. So as we talked about, we have the amount, and all I want to do is plus equal the dollar value that came in. 
You can even see here, besides the fact that this was unnecessary slang, dollar. Yo, it's, oh my god. Wow. I had a huge brain fart there. Did you see that? All right, cool. Live coding is, is, is tough. It's tough. So what I want to do now is I wrote some code, and now I want to test it. I'm going to, OK. I'm going to exit out of there. And all I'm going to do is check out Steven, who still has $200. And Steven wants to make a deposit. And how much is Steven depositing to die? 500 Ooh, spicy. 500 doll hairs? Ooh, wow. And it gives you back 700 which makes sense, because you started with two, you added five. That's quick math, right? So what about sometimes when you have to pay the tax man, right? Like, what does that sort of look like? Should I do Steven dot amount minus equals? Like, no, right? I could just easily do this. Bloop. Wow, you saw that? And then now, unfortunately, Steven has a lot of responsibilities. And he needs to pay the tax person. Very inclusive here. And this is, again, a dollar value. And this is minus equal. So now we've basically built out this functionality where I can, in fact, boop, boop. I can go to Steven. And I can say pay, which works with this as well. That tab auto finish, so powerful. And I can say, wow, Steven, uh, you're making buku bucks now. And here are your taxes. Mm. <laughs> that is rough. That's rough. It's the price to live in New York City. The greatest city in the world. The problem is, like, that's not a realistic thing, right? That's not realistic at all. We've talked about the overdraft fee. And on top of that, we talked about the fact that, like, sometimes... We want to write code that models the real world. So what is sort of like the English that comes out of here? If I'm pulling out money that I don't have, right? what should the code look like? Well, I'll help you out. Ready? If I'm pulling out money that I don't have, what should it sort of start with? Oof. If the amount is less than zero. That's the logic, right? And so in here, I can simply go if, right, my amount, and I take the amount, and I simply minus, oh, I think I removed this parentheses, uh, the dollar value. If this whole thing winds up being less than or equal to zero, then I need to do something. And what's that? I can probably return something, and that I can simply say, uh, you don't have that money. Sorry. Would you want to put that after, though? After amount minus equals. Well, the idea is that first you want to check, right? Uh, is right. the amount I'm trying to pull out more than my total? If it is, then like I don't, I don't actually have that money. I want to somehow magically auto cancel it. So you'll notice that I'm not actually sub subtracting any money, but I can, and I have those overdraft fees. So instead of just doing this, right? But let's test this code. Boop. Uh, sorry, I got to end this. Boop. Boop, boop. Also this. Boop. Cool. So what I'm going to do is simply go to Steven. And Steven's going to pay the tax person, and the person's going to do 201. What a clown. And naturally, by the if statement, it's going to say, you don't have that money, sorry. Well, we have the overdraft fee, and we can assign what that is. So not only is it you don't have the money, sorry, you don't have the money, and I'm going to punish you, all right, minus five doll hairs. So inside this if statement, I'm also going to do amount minus 5. Cool. So the overdraft fees, however, even in real life, will put you in the negatives. That is astounding and terrible. Huh? Oh, you're right. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Good catch. 
Well, no, we don't want to. We don't want to do that. We want to basically say your check bounced, right? I'm not going to pull away the full amount. I'm just going to punish you for basically trying to pay, trying to write a check your can't cash. You know what I'm saying? We've all been there. It's cool. We're adults. So. So what's then? So then the, it's not going to subtract anything, but you're still going to pay back. Correct. It's going to subtract 5 from. So you're going to be left with a 2 or one and five. Yeah. So that's the, that's the overdraft fee, right? And that is like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to pay something that I don't have the money for. It's going to yell at me and say, like, oh, you, you don't have the money. And on top of that, this happens in real life, by the way. On top of that, they're going to pull money from you. Money you don't have, um, and so poverty poverty is real and it's a terrible problem, um, and the system has certain flaws and it's very predatory. But that's a lot of opinion that I've just said that I wish I can actually remove from the recording. But uh, we're just gonna move on like adults here. So, boop 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 boop, and with that smooth transition, let's test our code. We're going to uh, uh, test our code, right? And again, I have $200, right? And for whatever reason, um, yeah, I, I, you're trying to pay something that costs $1 million. That's probably more than a million. I'm looking at a couple zeros. And it simply says, you don't have the money, and I'm going to punish you. Oh, sorry, minus equal five dollars. And then it's 195, right? So that is actually correct. And so with sort of object-oriented programming, what I can do is I can create a bunch of these bank accounts. I can make a bank account for everyone here. You get a bank account. You get a bank account. Right? So this is a lot of bank accounts to go around. And the idea is that's basically what's happening under the hood, even like in real life. And that is like you go to the ATM. And you're like, oh man, I have $18. And you're like, you know what? No big deal. I'm big baller. And you try to pull out 20 and it tells you, you don't actually have that money. And because you don't have that money, I'm going to charge you $3. Uh, it, yeah, I, uh, I grew up, I grew up what you would describe as very wealthy. Um, and so, and so, uh, yeah, that's basically the idea that like you can write code that models the real world, yeah. And so uh, you could start even thinking about like any other additional features. Oh, sorry. You want to know how I know that this didn't end the class and this ended the method? That's right, because I didn't see the. Oh wow, that was embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> end bank account class, right? Wow. Yeah, and so that's why we do these things. Um, great. So we want to start talking about building our own objects because then we get to build our own methods for them. If we use strings for sort of everything, then we're only limited to the methods that are on the string. And so that's kind of where I want to leave this, right? Where we can create our own classes, we can build our own methods, they model the real world. And because we can create our own classes, we can create our own methods on those classes, we can start using that instead of putting everything as a string. And that's going to be really useful as we start talking about relationships. Uh, what I mean by that is this is actually a really good example. So we talked about owners, right? In terms of the relationship between an owner and a bank account, how would you describe it? In the words using, just fill in the blank, right? A bank account has blank owners. Oh, okay. That wasn't what I was looking for, but that's because I asked a terrible question. The idea is that a bank account can have many owners, right? So like your, your joint account, like let's start thinking in even the hypothetical or the theoretical or hypothetical, that like let's say you're your name's Evans, right? You're like this 15-year-old Chinese stud. You have zero dollars in your bank account, and <laughs> you want to add a, another person on this account. 
So you go to like your best friend, uh, and you're like, "Yo, mom, can you please uh, get on this? <laughs> can you please get on this bank account with me?" Uh, and the idea is that like not just mom, but I can also go to my other best friend, dad, obviously, and be like, "Hey, can you get on this bank account?" And so the idea is that owner, right? Right now, typically, is what data type? A string. But if it could have multiple owners, right, the idea is that we probably are going to start thinking about a different data type. And so what data type do we know that can hold multiple things? Right? Either a hash or an array. Um, we'll start to see what happens if we use an array here, uh, and we'll dive into sort of like the complexities of these relationships tomorrow when we talk about intro to relationships. <laughs> All right, and uh, if there's no sort of other questions, that's kind of the idea behind the class. It being a blueprint, you can create these objects, you can call methods on them, you could build your own methods, and now we can build all of these objects, have their own methods, so we do not rely on just this sort of string as sort of the default for everything. Cool? All right, that's all I have for you. If there's no other questions, um, 